Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Amanda. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is May 19, 1991. I live in Montgomery, Alabama, and my home group is the Happy Hour Group. We have meetings every day at 6.30 a.m., at noon, and at 6 p.m. You won't see me at the 6.30 a.m. meeting. It takes too long to look like this. Catch me at the noon, and sometimes you'll see me at the six. Um, you walk in our door, and, and painted on the wall as you walk in the front door, it says, We aren't a glum lot. We absolutely insist on enjoying life, page 132. You have a seat, and there's a little plaque over the chairperson's head, and it says, uh, Happy hour is not a time of day. It is a state of mind. And I knew when I saw that that I was home. Cause today I am happy, joyous, and free. Um, because of AA, because of the fellowship, because of my sponsor, because of the hard work I put in this program. It says if we are painstaking people, um, and because of the way to God today. Uh, I'm charged with telling you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like today. Uh, if you've heard me before, look, the one I was like really doesn't get to change a whole lot. What happened, what happened, what really thrills my soul is what I'm like today and getting to share the miracles because of being in this program, and there's never enough time for me to get to share all of that. But before I get started, I have to tell a blonde joke, because that's just what I do. I love a good blonde joke. (laughs) And um, some friends of mine, hopefully in a few months, are going to be on an airplane, and so in honor of that, I'm going to tell my favorite blonde joke about flying. Everybody's getting on the plane. They're going to L.A. Blonde, you know, gets on the plane, and she goes up to first class, and she finds her a comfy seat, and she sits down. Stewardess comes by and she's checking everybody's tickets. Well, the blonde's ticket is not for first class. Her ticket is for coach. Stewardess is like, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but she don't have a first class ticket. May I please ask you to to rise and go toward the back of the plane and and get in your seat? She said, no, I don't think so. I like this seat. Look at all my leg room. It's all cushy. I like it right here. Thank you very much. (laughs) Stewardess goes off up to the head stewardess. She's like, look, we got a blonde in first class. You're going to have to come help me because she ain't moving. That's not her seat. She's not moving. So the head stewardess comes back to the blonde and she says, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you have a coach ticket and we need you to please rise and go back to the coach area and find your seat. We're getting ready to take off. Blonde thinks about it for a minute. She says, no, you know, I really like it. That lady over there is handing out champagne. I like this seat. I think I'm going to be good right here. Stewardess just looks at her, can't believe this lady is not getting up. So she gets up. She goes up to the cockpit and she talks to the captain. She says, Captain, we have a problem. We can't take off because we've got this blonde in first class, and she won't get up out of that seat and move to her seat in coach. The captain says, I got this. I'll take care of it. Captain walks back to the stewardess with his best smile. He leans down to her and he whispers something in her ear. Doesn't take very long. Honey, that blonde gets up. She gets her stuff out of that over bin, and she is running back to coach as fast as she can and finds her seat, and she sat down. Stewardesses are just in awe. What in the world did he say? So they asked the pilot, said, Sir, what in the world did you say to her to make her get up and move? He said, I told her that first class wasn't going to L.A. <laughs> I love them. If you got them, tell me some after the after the meeting, because I love them. <laughs> what I was like was, um, I grew up in a small town, Andalusia, Alabama, which is at the bottom of the state of Alabama, uh, pretty much about 45 minutes from Fort Walton Beach. A lot of times, if you've had to go to Fort Walton Beach or Seaside, you've driven by Andalusia, either on Florida or Bruton Highway. Uh, not a very big town. I live five miles outside of town in the country. Um... My mother uh, raised me. Uh, she was most of the time a single mother. Uh, I was the only child, the first grandchild on both sides, and the first great-grandchild on both sides. So to say that I came into this world with a little bit of self-centeredness is an understatement. <laughs> um, I was spoiled. I was the apple of everybody's eye. 
Um, and you know, we uh, we're born and and we're on the playground and things start happening and kids start talking to one another and you know most of the alcoholics that I've talked to in my life we talk about that there was a hole inside of us. There was something that made us feel different. And i got to say this real quick. If you're a newcomer, I want to encourage you to listen to the similarities in your story and my story. And you see, I found in a lot of speakers' meetings, some of the details may be different, but some of the feelings we talk about and the general overtones, all of us have experienced it. You know, that's why I love alcoholics. I can walk up to an alcoholic and my heart is speaking to their heart. I know their pain and they know my pain. So I want to encourage you to listen with open ears this evening. So one of the first reasons why I felt different was being on the playground. You know, kids talk about what their parents do. Well, I could tell what my mother did, but I couldn't tell what my father did, so I would just say that I don't have a father. You see, my mother had to leave my father when she was six months pregnant with me the day that he took a shotgun to her and threatened to kill her. He was a drug addict and a drunk, and uh, he used to beat her up quite often. And so the day he got the shotgun out was the day she called her daddy, my people, and said, come get me. And uh, Peepaw brought us to um, Andalusia, Alabama, and that's where I grew up. Like I said, it's a small town. Uh, I grew up most of the time with my grandparents, Meemaw and Peepaw. Uh, Peepaw was a retired lieutenant colonel in the Army. So what that meant for me is I knew which forts to use when we went out places. I knew that children were to be seen and not heard. I knew to always have a smile on my face. If anybody asks me how our family's doing, we are fine. <laughs> That you keep the family secrets, um, all the little things that, that I was taught. I knew how to answer the phone. Lieutenant Colonel J.T.'s residence, this is Amanda, how may I help you? <laughs> yeah, try saying that when you're five years old. <laughs> Everybody in that town looked like me, talked like us. Uh, I grew up going to the American Legion on every Friday night playing bingo. Um, like I, he had a lot of military friends and a lot of friends there in Andalusia. We would have fish fries at our house. We had two ponds, Peepaw's Pond and my Aunt Opal's Pond, which is right across the street. So a lot of times on Saturday we would fish all day and then have a huge fish fry that night. My first um, contact with alcohol was in my family members that would come over for those social events. And I loved being around them. Boy, when Meemaw would go over there, that kitchen sink started doing that little dip dance. When she was getting the liquor out from under the kitchen sink and making toddies for everybody. And everybody would start laughing and talking and their cheeks would get red and they started telling all these stories and my Uncle MC would talk about the boogeyman and I loved it. I loved it. I know today that you can shape anything on my family tree, a twig, a leaf, a branch, and a gambler, a drug addict, or an alcoholic will fall off. <laughs> And they were my favorite people. <laughs> and they're still my favorite people. Um, so I loved being around them. I loved when all that would come out. And, and so I associated it with social and having a good time and family. Um, now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, when I was eight years old, my mother asked me to make a decision that um, is hard for this little eight-year-old to make. She decided that she wanted to go back to school and better herself. And I need to throw this in here, too. By this time, she'd been married and divorced more than once. I think it was four. Um, I may be off count with that. Um, so my life had been bouncing back and forth a lot. You know, but any time she was not with a man, we would live with me, Mom, and Peepaw. And sometimes she would be with a man, and I would live with me, Mom, and Peepaw. I never knew what I was going to get in that experience. So at eight years old, she decided she was going to better herself, and she wanted to go to the UAB College in Birmingham and uh, get her master's degree. And so she asked me, did I want to move to Birmingham with her, or did I want to stay in Andalusia? Now, I never knew what life was going to be like if I went off with my mama. I remember living in a shack one time that had this ugly orange shag rug carpet. And um, when we would walk in, it was a race to see who could get to the chairs fast enough to jump on, because when you cut the lights on, the roaches and the rats just got in the air. I remember living in a, in a place one time, and I remember laying down in my bed, and, and the roaches crawling across the windowsill over my head. So I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to move to Birmingham with my mama. Because what if I got up there, what would that mean for me? And what if she found a man, and what would happen to me if she did find a man? So I chose to stay with me, Mom, people. My grandparents were there, my great-grandparents were there, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. I love being in Andalusia. And so Mama leaves for four years, and I stay with me, Mom, people. Now, I will tell you, a lot changed in me those four years, and I started developing those survival skills that I would need later on. And I'm going to skip ahead to the age of 12. 
I heard a speaker say one time, if we could keep people from becoming Southern Baptists and turning 12, we'd have a lot fewer alcoholics. <laughs> And this was certainly true in my case, and I will tell you why. Um, I'm going to tell you about the age of 12 for me. The first thing that happened uh, when I was 12 years old was I learned a lot. Um, you know, my grandmother was raised in the days of you did not dare pick up the phone to call DHR or Child Protective Services. You took a beating, and you took it. And I dare you to put your finger on the phone to call anybody for help, okay? So that's how she was. And we got, when we got whoopings, I'd have to go out to the rose bush and pick a switch. And if it didn't happen to, to it, she would go get one for you. And Lord help you if she picked out the switch, because then it was just going to be on. It would be awful. <laughs> so I like to pick them with a lot of swish and not as many thorns. That was my trick. Um, but on this particular day, me and I was at the front of the school, and I was at the back. We had got our signals crossed, and I was not where I was supposed to be. And she did not know where I was for two and a half hours. So the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh, Lord. And she finds me, this is not going to be pretty. This ain't going to be pretty. And I didn't know what to do. Well, she finally found me, and it wasn't pretty. I got beat so bad that day I had blood running down my legs. And I remember calling Mama and telling her what had happened. And she drove the four and a half hours in front of him. And she told my mom not to ever lay another hand on me. And she didn't. And my mother goes back to Birmingham. The second thing that happened when I was 12 was, you know, um, Mima and Peepaw were my rock. Now, I had seen Mama in her relationships argue with men. And I remember getting between them one night because this one guy was going to break her arm. And, and it was I didn't like all that. I didn't like the arguing and the fighting and all of that. Now, my mother will tell you she's never heard me mom and pa argue. Well, that wasn't my truth. I would get up in the middle of the night wanting a glass of water, and there's me mom and pa standing there in the hallway, and pa was in his underwear, and me mom still got a girdle on, and they're all going at it. <laughs> I didn't get my drink of water. I'd have to go back and lay, that, lay down because I just couldn't. I, I couldn't believe that that was going on in that house. Because that struck a lot of fear in me. So I'm outside fishing with Peepaw one day. We're down on the pond. I love to go fishing with my Peepaw. And I love my Peepaw. And we're out there fishing and we're talking. And somehow we got on the subject of me, Ma, and Peepaw arguing. And I said, well, Peepaw, why don't you just get a divorce? Mama does it all the time. <laughs> didn't seem to be that big of a deal. So a few weeks later, I'm not really sure how much longer, but I come home one day after school, and Peepaw's sitting at the head of the table, and Meemaw's sitting in her spot, and she's been crying, and Meemaw didn't cry a whole lot. So I knew when I walked in the room that something wasn't right. Something was off. Peepaw says, come here, Amanda. Come over here and sit in my lap. And I love to sit in my Peepaw's lap. I go over there, and I sit in his lap, and he says, um, do you remember that conversation we had on the pond one day about Meemaw and I arguing? And I said, well, yes, sir, I remember. And he said, well, do you remember what you said? And I said, well, yes, sir, I do. I said, why don't y'all get a divorce? And he said, well, we are. So you see, in my 12-year-old mind, if I had not spoke those words out loud, if I had not said that, my me, mom, my people would not be getting a divorce. It was all my fault. It was all my fault. If I had just kept my mouth shut, then my home would still be intact. Now, the reality of that situation is that he was sleeping with her married best friend. <laughs> And he built a house right across the pond with this new woman that me mom could see out of her kitchen window every day of the rest of her life. That was the reality. But in my little mind, I didn't get that. It was all my fault. The third thing that happened when I was 12, when Mama comes back from college and um, she came home to a different child, I had learned survival skills. I had learned to lie um, because I knew after that day I got that beaten, I was going to lie even if I didn't have to. I had learned to CYA. I lied when the truth was good enough. I've, I've mastered the craft of not telling the truth because I was not ever going to have that kind of pain again. So she came home to a different child, and she had told me that when I was 12, I could find my real father. I had one picture of my mother and my father, and it was them on their wedding day. There's my mother in her beautiful white gown that she borrowed from Cousin Cynthia, and my cousin Philip married them. And, and there's my daddy, six foot five, slender guy, clean military haircut, one blue eye, one green eye. He was good looking. I could see why she married him. And that's the one picture that I had of him. So that was my ideal of what I was going to get, you know. And, and when she reminded me that I could find my real father, I thought, you know, I've always felt different. There's always been something wrong with me. Maybe when I find him, maybe when I feel my whole life. Maybe he's rich. Maybe he can take me away from all this. I don't know, but maybe that'll make me better than what I am today once I find him. So she starts making phone calls, and sure enough, she finds him. 
Uh, she found him when she called up Grandma and found out he was living in her basement. That should have been clue number one. <laughs> so her and me and my favorite aunt, Aunt Mutton, is probably one of us, um, all traipsed up to Spring Hill, Tennessee. Now, that's a little town in Tennessee. It's right outside of Columbia. And if you know it today, it's because that's where they built the Saturn plant. And um, all that used to be beautiful farmland. So we go up to Grandma's house, and it's probably around lunchtime, and we knock on the door, and my Grandma answers the door, which what I was sure was her best nightgown. <laughs> and she introduces herself, and then um, my Grandpa answers the door, and he's six foot six, and he's wide as the frame. And um, he's a he's a KKK card carrying NRA president, hillbilly from Tennessee. <laughs> and we walk in the house, and this entire room is covered with gun cabinets. I mean, it's, I had never seen anything like it before in my life. So we sit down, and we pretend to try to have a conversation, you know. And I hear this noise coming up the driveway, and I didn't know what that noise was then. Today I know it was a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Harley, 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 Harley. <laughs> Today I love that sound, but then I didn't know what it was. So it comes up the driveway, and we and we look out the front window, and the only way I know how to describe it was there's a woolly burger sitting on that Harley. <laughs> it gets off the motorcycle, and it's about six foot six. It's got a beard down to his belly button. It's got hair down to his butt. It is covered in tattoos, and this one says F off, and I had never even heard that, let alone seen it in ink on somebody's body. <laughs> And it, <laughs> yeah. and it comes in the front door and it says, well, aren't you going to hug your old man? No, not today. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, that was the other half of me. Well, I don't know about y'all, but that ain't filling out no hole I got, and I need a drink. <laughs> It wasn't long after that. We're in Andalusia. My best friend was a guy, and his parents had a condo down there in Panama City, and we all traipsed off him and me and a bunch of our friends. And we go down to Panama City, and um, Dad starts walking around taking drink orders. Well, my best friend Tim orders a six-pack of, six of peach wine cola. And I looked at him, and I said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I'll take one of them. Mr. Tom goes off to the store. He comes back, and he brings us our drinks. I drank every last one of them peach wine coolers, and I blacked out and passed out and had the best night's sleep of my life. <laughs> that was my first experience with alcohol. When I took that alcohol into my system, all of it at once, and was able to pass out all the voices in my head, shut up. You see, there had not been a night in my little life that the voices in my head weren't going. I was already different. I had a single mother. She couldn't stay married. She always had a boyfriend. Men aren't going to make her happy. Now my mom and my people who are supposed to be my solid parental figures are divorced. I'm mad at my people because he cheated on my mom. He's supposed to be my male role model. Now I've met my daddy. Oh, God, that's a whole other <laughs> bag of issues. All the voices in my head shut up. All the fear that I had. What's going to happen to me? What's my life going to look like? How am I going to survive in what I have been put in? All of that shut up. Now, I didn't become an alcoholic overnight, but at every opportunity I could, I began to drink. I played out for a saxophone in the marching band for the high school and the middle school. So after the high school football game, somebody was having a field party. And the loser's not that big. You got Hardee's on one end and McDonald's on the other. It's about a two-mile stretch. And we mix our drinks in Hardee's, and we drink them all the way through town to McDonald's. And by then, it'd be time to mix some more. So we'd remix some more <laughs> and drive the two miles back through town and go to Hardee's. That was our Saturday night and Friday night pass. <laughs> and if it was a really good night, I'd go in TGY parking lot and do donuts in my 65 Volkswagen. <laughs> well, you know, I was I was always out of the house. I was a typical overachiever. I was dancing three nights a week. I was in the band. I was in church. I was raised in church. Um, I was in the choir. I was in the ensemble at school. And I know today that I was doing whatever I could to get out of that house, to get out of that environment. Take me somewhere else, please. Please take me somewhere else from where I am. Get me out of this skin. Well, it had always been a dream of mine to go to the University of Alabama. I'm a huge Roll Tide fan. And um, i got to finish where the game starts. Not really. <laughs> Alabama's an hour behind. That's, that's how come we're doing this right now. Not really. <laughs> Y'all are good. 
Um, so, um, you know, that had always been a dream of mine. Well, the man that Mama was married to at the time, my senior year in college, had a little money, and he was able to send me to the University of Alabama, and I was so excited. I was so excited. Well, let me tell you, and lose your small town. I said that. We had maybe 100 people in our little band. Well, honey, when you get up there and march in the million-dollar band, you have 415 brand-new best friends. And that was a lot. And Thursday night, we had the Green Book Party. And Friday night, we had the party before the game. And Saturday, we were either celebrating a win or commiserating a loss. Either way, we drank it. <laughs> Sunday was, I love Dallas Cowboy football, so I was always watching pro football somewhere on Sunday afternoons. And it, it became a whole new can of worms for me. You know, there were people up there who, who I could drink with on a more regular basis. Um, I left out a little part, but let me go back and, and grab that real quick. You know, there was a lot of times we'd be sitting at the kitchen table at Meemaw's house, and um, I, had, I knew where her liquor was. And after I'd had that incident at the beach, uh, I would begin to steal liquor from Meemaw's cabinet. Um, and I loved to steal her 151 Bacardi rum. And what I would do is I would pour out the Sprite bottle, and I'd fill up my Sprite bottle with 151 rum, and we'd all be sitting at the dinner table, and I'd be getting my drink up, you know. So by the time I'm at college, I'm, I'm drinking pretty much any, any time I want to, any way I can get it. Well, i got to share something real quick. At one of the first band parties that we had, um, I was raped. And uh, I share that because I never know who in the audience needs to hear that, but that was especially traumatic for me because I was a virgin. You see, I had wanted to save myself. I wanted to be different than my mother. I didn't want to have all the men in my life like she did. So when that happened to me, I felt like I was ruined. I felt like I was spoiled. And I began to fall in love a lot to try to make that feel right. Um, I'm proud to say, to say today I am a recovering slut. <laughs> something I'm proud of, but you know what? I did what I had to do to get what I had to have. Um, I dropped out that first semester at college, and my mother said, well, you got to come home. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. And I went up there, and I got me an apartment. Um, some friends of mine who drank like I did lived in that same apartment building. I got me a job at the landing restaurant, which conveniently had a bar in it, um, because later in my drinking, that was pretty much the only food. If I could eat food, would be the happy hour food. And I proceeded to um, progress in my drinking career. Um, now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to February 19th, 1991. That was a very important day in my life because that's the day my big mama died. You know, she was my great-grandmother, and I felt like she was the only somebody who unconditionally loved me. You know, I felt like my grandparents had some conditions on that. I had to do good in school for people to love me. I had to be a good little girl and use my manners for me to love me. I didn't know what it was going to take for my mama to love me. But big mama loved me no matter what. It didn't matter. None of that mattered. I could go to her house and she'd fix me macaroni and cheese and hug me and tell me that she loved me and everything was going to be okay, and i believe her. And that was it. So when she died, it just it just about killed me. And I remember my friend from Tuscaloosa driving me down to Andalusia for the funeral. And I remember telling her, I was like, you know what, big mama used to take me to that church. And I remember that preacher talking about that even if you thought it, it was just like sinning it. It was just like doing it, that even thinking it was a sin. Well, you know what? I'm going to hell anyway. Let me think how fast I can get there. And the next three months were a blur to me. And i got to tell you, I'm a coward. I was trying to die, but I didn't want to shoot myself in the face because I thought I was cute. I didn't want to have to have a closed casket. <laughs> I was terrified of needles. I still don't like shots today. They have to hold me down. So I, did, I was scared of that stuff. But alcohol was a gateway drug for me, and and I did do some other stuff, um, and I began to drink every day. The next three months of my life are absolutely a blur, absolutely a blur. I have pieces and bits uh, that I can remember, and I'll share the ones that I can remember with, with you. I remember waking up one night, and um, it's really bright on this side of me, and my girlfriend is having, has got my feet, and she is pulling me out of the street. She is pulling me out of the middle of McFarland Avenue, which is one of the busiest streets in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, because all of a sudden I have decided to lay down and take a nap in front of oncoming traffic. <laughs> I woke up in a concrete stairwell one day. I have no idea where I was. Uh, my head is hanging over in a trash can. I'm covered in blood and pee and puke and anything else that you can think of. 
Sometimes I would wake up in a, in a bed next to a man and I'd have to get up and I'd have to start going through the medicine plan and seeing what I could get to get the alcohol in my system. Sometimes it was NyQuil. Sometimes it was cold medicine. Sometimes it was Listerine. Sometimes it was perfume. Whatever I could get my hands on to get me out of where I was to get me some more alcohol. I remember standing there at the Ivory Tusk one night and uh, watching the band play and I've got a cigarette in this hand and a Miller Lite long neck in this hand and uh, I'm listening to the band and um, I absolutely clap in my pants. <laughs> I rock on. <laughs> I don't move a muscle. <laughs> don't move a muscle. You know, and I began to realize that something is not right with this picture. <laughs> This is not the nice young lady that my grandparents raised me to be. You know, I looked awful. Um, I would take just enough money for two drinks. All right, I'm at the bar, I'm having two drinks. What in the world is the point of having two drinks? I gotta have some more. So they did keep them things sitting next to me, and I start winking and using my feminine wild, and he'd buy my drinks the rest of the night. Um, and, you know, I say that about the recovering slut. I, that really was an eye-opener for me. I'll never forget my sponsor. i got to share this real quick. We were going through um, the steps, and uh, she said, Amanda, she said, did you ever let a guy take you out to dinner and give him some after? Well, sure. Well, did you ever have a guy buy you drinks all night long, and then you'd give him a little bit when you got that? Well, well yeah. She's like, girl, you was a hoe. You just wasn't getting paid. <laughs> that was an eye-opener for me. Um, so it didn't even matter if I would take money or wouldn't take money because I would use the skills that I had learned to manipulate and connive and do what I had to do to get what I needed. So on May 18th, 1991, there's a knock at my door. Well, I had just got in. I hadn't been in very long. And I'm nosy. So I go to the door and put my ear to the door to see who it is. I, and I hear the voices. I hear them out. I hear them out there. Well, I wait for the voices to leave, and I really am nosy. And so I open the door to see who it was. And I open the door, and it's my mother's best friend standing there, and she screams down the walkway, Angie, Angie, she's here, she's here. And my mother comes running down the walkway, and she hugs me, and she tells me she loves me, and it's going to be okay. Now, my mother had no idea what was going on with me. I had not talked to my mother or my grandmother in over three months, not since Big Mama died. They had not seen or heard from me since Big Mama's funeral. So one reason why I say, by the grace of God, I am sober today is because my mom is showing up that day. She'd been having nightmares for days about coming to Tuscaloosa, opening the door to my apartment and finding me naked, dead on my bed. And she had that dream, but she couldn't stand it anymore, and she showed up. Well, here she is. She says, you know what? We can go right now and have some lunch, and I'll leave and wish you well, or you can decide to get some help. I don't know what's going on with you, but something is, and you've got two hours to make that decision. So my mother and one of her best friends leave, and the other best friend stays with me. And and I tell her some valuable information. Now, and i, I got to backtrack just a second. One of the things that I like to do when I would come to is I wanted to make myself feel better. Who doesn't want to feel better after having the nights like I had had? So I would go shopping. And I might buy me a whole new wardrobe, or I might buy you a new bedroom set, or I might buy a new pair of expensive shoes. And it never occurred to me that just because there were checks left in the checkbook that there might not be money in the account to back that up. <laughs> that was never a thought in my mind. So, Mama leaves, the best friend standing there, and I said, well, you know, I might have written a few bad checks. Now, they had just come up the stairs to my apartment, and they had seen my mailbox, which is on the wall, overflowing with all these long brown envelopes that said federal government. I had not touched those envelopes. I was scared to death. I wasn't messing with them, because you see, if I touched one, that would make it real, and I'd have to do something about it. So as long as I left it there, I could pretend like it did not exist. <laughs> so I told her that, and she called our lawyer friend, Andrew and she said, oh, Melody. He said, Tuscaloosa County is the worst county in Alabama to write a bad check. He said, has she written any over 200? Because every one of that is a felony. And I had no clue. And I said, Millie, I don't know. So needless to say, it did not take me two hours to realize that my young buck was going to have to get some help or I was going to jail. So Mama comes back, and I said, you know what? I'd like to get some help. So we load up everything in the U-Haul. We drive the four and a half hours to Andalusia. We sleep for two hours. I get up. 
that it was oh dark thirty. It was way too early for me. And we drive the four and a half hours to Mobile, Alabama. That's why my sobriety date is May 19th, 1991. Because on May 19th at 9 o'clock that morning, I was on the 10th floor of Providence Hospital in Mobile in the psychiatric unit on lockdown. I mean, I still hear them doors closing behind me. Um, I was in treatment. I was on the psych ward. Mommy didn't know if I was crazy or what was going on, but something was wrong with me. So here I am in treatment. Okay, now what? Well, you know, they start doing that psychological testing, and so they did a flash card, and, and immediately I remembered about being raped, and I was able to work through that in uh, treatment, and I'm so grateful for that today. And I was able to work through the anger that I had at men, because y'all didn't have nothing for me. I mean, from my daddy to my people to any of y'all, I didn't want a man in my life, y'all were awful. Um, I was able to work through a lot of that in treatment. So one day, you know, I'm in there and talking to my little psychiatrist, and um, I might have mentioned to him that I might have drank a little bit, just a little. What I didn't know was he was a recovering alcoholic. So he recognized that in me, and he started sending my young butt to those meetings. Well, I was kind of excited to get to be off the 10th floor, um, but I didn't really like having to go to the meetings. And I got it. I don't know if you figured it out yet, because I don't tell my age, but at this time I'm 19, and I'm in treatment, and I turned 20 while I was in treatment. And um, so they start sending me to those AA meetings. And I would sit in the back of the room with my knees up around my chest, and I wore my hair where it would cover cover my face. I had one little slit right here for me to see, and the rest of it was all hair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had hollowed out eyes. I, the only thing I had been eating was cherry Kool-Aid and raw cookie dough, if I could keep that down. And I was just living on liquor. That's all I was living on. Um, so I know I didn't look all that hot, you know. But I'm sitting in the back, and these people want to shake my hand and hug me and tell me keep coming back and want to talk to me and I'm like well you just leave me alone just leave me alone I gotta do my time I don't want nothing from you what do you want from me I didn't trust y'all I didn't trust y'all and one day we had a speaker meeting at Alano Club uh it's right off of airport boulevard down there it's still there today I got to go there two years ago um and this young lady got up there well I'm listening to her and she started telling my story now, up until this time, I didn't hear what y'all had to say in me, except I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, and I'm not like her. But when this young lady got up there, I could no longer deny. I absolutely conceded with my innermost self. You see, she had done everything just like I did. Um, and she was saying that she was sober. Now, I didn't know if I believed that yet, but she's up there talking about that she was sober. And that her life has changed, and that she's different, and that she's worked the steps and all this stuff. And when I heard her... It absolutely gave me a sense of hope because if she's an alcoholic and she's standing up there and she looks good, she's smiling, then maybe there's hope for me. Maybe I don't have to die. Maybe I don't have to go back and do the things that I had been doing because I was not happy with myself. I was the absolute picture of pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. I went back to that treatment center, and I had a new way of thinking. I opened up my ears. I began to listen to meetings differently. I worked the first three steps with our counselor in treatment. And uh, I'll never forget the day we came down um, that I was leaving treatment. Jeannie was in there with me, and she said, um, she said, Amanda, you're so young. Why, you're so young. Do you really think you can go the rest of your life without taking a drink of alcohol? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, Jeannie, they tell me I don't have to think like that, but all I've got to do is not drink today. And I can do anything today, just for today. Just for today. So the day that I left treatment, I didn't really know where I was going. You see, while I was in there, my mama had got two brown paper sacks full of all those official-looking documents out of my mailbox. She had talked to the lawyer, uh, and we found out that with good behavior, that I was looking at at least 15 years in Junior Tutwaller Prison, which is the women's prison, and we tucked her right outside of Montgomery. I had several checks that were felony. Um, and I was not excited about having to go to prison. <laughs> that just wasn't on my agenda. I don't know if we could have hairspray in there. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know what that life was going to look like for me, but I felt pretty sure that I didn't want that life. So, the day that I left, Mama's in the elevator with me, and we go downstairs, and we get in her car, and she breaks out this contract. It's a long contract, and uh, it's got all kind of stuff on there, y'all. I mean, I'm having to do some heavy reading, and I'm only, I'm, I'm 60 days sober. I got to stay in treatment for 60 days, which is unheard of, but that's how sick I was. 
And um, I'm reading this contract, and it says things like, okay, Mama agrees not to have me in seminar, and I agree not to have me in seminar. I can drive Mama's car, but i got to clean it and got to put gas in it. i got to uh, cook at least one night a week, which at the time I think the only thing I knew how to make was Rotel dip. <laughs> uh, had I, just on down the list, had all this crazy mess. And then it had this paragraph at the bottom that really interested me. And what it said was that Mama had went to every single place that I wrote a bad check. And she had paid back all that money. And it came to the total of $10,000. And she was giving me 10 years to pay that money off, or I would have to go finish my time at Julia Tutwala. Ooh, I had to play about that for a minute. Prison, living with Mama. Prison, living with Mama. <laughs> Luckily, I chose living with Mama, and uh, I signed that contract, went back and doesn't live with her. Now, i got to jump ahead for a minute, because i got to tell you one of the miracles out of this program. I'm eight and a half years sober. Um, doing good, doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, living a good life, happy, joy, and free. Um, I had paid off just about all of that money. And y'all, let me tell you, just because you get sober don't mean it gets easy. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of jobs I've had, um, and I'll get to that in a minute, but it was hard getting that money for her. Um, so, here I am. And I'm starting to have a little fear about, I just don't know if I can pay this last bit off. It was around $3,000. I can't remember the exact amount. Well, I'm in Montgomery, and I don't know about over here, but in Montgomery we have what's called area assembly. It's where the groups all come together one time, uh, four quarters a year, and um, it's, a, it's, it's the group's business meeting, like the group business meeting. Does that make sense? So we're up there at area assembly, and um, we just got down into the Waffle House, and I'm headed back over to where area assembly is, and I'm at a stoplight on a hill, and there's this big company truck in front of me, and I'm in my little bitty uh, Toyota for sale behind him. <laughs> big company truck. <laughs> so apparently he wasn't a very good driver when it came to a stick and he was proceeded to let that bad boy roll back over me on that hill I mean I can't get out of the car the people at the Waffle House thank goodness knew me and came out and helped me and I'm all busted up and so we get a lawyer and he's in a company truck so they're paying for my doctor bills and all this stuff and uh, one day my lawyer called me in the office and said we settled the case come on down I say alright so I go down there and uh he gives me this check, and I said, well, what is it? He's like, well, we settled your case, and this is this is what you get. Out of the lawyer fees and everything else, this is what you get. It was the exact amount that I had left to pay my mom. But for the grace of God. Whew. So anyway, <laughs> I'm in the car with Mama, and we're heading to Dothan, Alabama, and that's where I proceed to get sober. I'm living with her, and... um. I'm, I'm having my first year of sobriety. I'm, I, my clubhouse at that time where I got sober is the Level Plains Clubhouse. It's in the Wiregrass Club, which is on 84 between Dothan and Enterprise. There's only one caution light in Level Plains, and you turn it to caution light, and there's a stop sign, and there's a bar, and there's the Wiregrass Club conveniently next to the bar. And uh, that's why I got sober. And I can still picture going in that room just like I see all of you today. And I'm not kidding when I tell you there was at least 200 years of sobriety sitting around those tables. I can still see Mr. Jane, Mr. Joe, Mr. Fred, Dolly, Polly, Darlene, everybody sitting there. I can see them just as good as I see you. And right here, there's a little bitty short lady with curly blonde hair with glasses on named Miss Peggy. And there's an empty chair. And right next to that empty chair, there's a little bitty short, blonde, curly-headed lady named Gloria. And that was my sponsor on the right my grand sponsor on the left. And Miss Peggy said, come here, baby, you come sit by me. And that was my seat. That was my seat. I did more than 90 meetings in 90 days. I wanted whatever you had. I did whatever you told me to do. I had quit smoking. It didn't matter. They told me to clean up the ashtrays. I cleaned up the ashtrays. I didn't drink coffee. I was told to make coffee. I learned how to make coffee. I was there 15 minutes before the meeting. I was there 15 minutes after the meeting. I was putting up chairs. I was taking down chairs. I was being carted around all over the place. We, Mr. Bill, I love him. He had the boat. And uh, it was a big burgundy car. And um, he died with 28 years sobriety, but I just love him. And he'd say, all right, Miss Amanda, you be ready in 15 minutes. And I would say, yes, sir, and hang up the phone. But that's just what you did. I didn't get suggested anything. I got told what to do, and I did it. <laughs> well, he would come by and pick me up, and I would never know. It might just be me and him. There might be 10 of us all up in that boat. And we never knew if we were going to Dothan or Enterprise or Montgomery or going to a meeting. And then it was always Denny's or Waffle House afterwards. And I love those people, and they raised me up in this program. And i got to tell you about that very first night in that clubhouse. I had just met Gloria, and I had just met Miss Peggy. And after the meeting, Gloria looked at me, 
Then she said, Amanda, I want you to know something. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I want you to know that as of this moment, you never have to take another drink of alcohol again if you don't want to. And I said, really? And she said, yes. And I took her at her word. I did everything they told me to do. I worked the 12 steps. I did everything they told me to do. I had three different jobs in two different towns that first year of sobriety. Getting sober is not easy, but I was willing to go to any length. I did not want to have to go be that person that I was. I didn't want to have to live my life hunting that alcohol every day in my life. Now, i got to skip ahead. See, that's what I'm talking about. You get to the miracle of this stuff, and you only got ten minutes left. <laughs> so, um, like I said, that first year of sobriety wasn't easy, but I did what I was told to do. I want to skip ahead to three years sober. My sponsor calls these phases of our development. And what I have learned in my life as I'm talking to other people with long-term sobriety is that there seems to be periods in our sobriety that are phases of our development. Maybe it's a spiritual growth. Maybe it's an emotional growth. But it's definitely a time of growth in our life. And my first one came right around three and a half years sober. Um, I had a good man. I had a good job. I was working a good program. Um, I loved my job. And there was a bunch of girls there, and um, they wanted to go out dancing on a Friday night. Now, I love to dance. I love to dance. Um, so by all means, let's. Let's go. And so we hauled up in the car and we go dancing. And I had such a good time on that Friday night that it really occurred to me that I was missing my Friday night meeting. So the next week when they call me, okay, we're going to go again. Are you in? Oh, yeah, I'm in. Let's go. Okay, so now I'm missing my second Friday night meeting. And I have not called my sponsor to tell her where I am. So this goes on for a few weeks. And there's a process that starts happening. You know, I'm not really praying because I don't want God to know what I'm doing. <laughs> Makes sense in my alcoholic mind. You know? Not calling my sponsor because I don't really want her to know what I'm doing. Because I'm having a good time. You know? I don't really see anything wrong with it. And then all of a sudden, it hit me one night how easy it would be to pick up that little light long neck off that table right there and take me a big old swing. And I got to tell you, in that nanosecond, it scared me to death. Absolutely scared me to death. I had a moment of clarity. I ran outside. I called my sponsor on the cell phone. Um, she met me at the clubhouse at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we sat down on that back step. And she said, Amanda, the big book talks about this. The big book talks about that we come to a crossroads. Are you really think that you're an alcoholic? This time I'm, I'm maybe 24 years old. Are you really going to do this deal? Or are you going to go back out there and get you some more research? See what else is out there. And I really thought about it that night, and I really prayed hard, and, and I decided that night that I did not want to drink, that I really was an alcoholic. You know, this is how it was presented to me right after I got out of treatment. If I was told that I had cancer, I'm eat up with it. But I'm told that, you know what, the CVS down the street tomorrow is going to have a little blue pill, and that little blue pill is going to cure every cancer you got. Would you take that little blue pill? Honey, I'd be out there camping three days before being first in line to get that little blue pill because I want to live. I want to take that little blue pill and get rid of all my cancer and do all the other stuff that I want to do. Well, I have the disease of alcoholism, and this is my little blue pill. Now, this is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I spoke at a treatment center Thursday, and I had a lady scream out right after I said that, Is that the Bible? It really is my big book. I'm trying to see Alcoholics Anonymous. There it is. Okay. It's just in a cover. But I have the disease of alcoholism, and this is my little blue pill, and I have to take it every day. It is a program of action. I cannot sit in the room and just read the steps on the wall and expect a miraculous cure to fall out of the sky and me be done. Maybe that's your experience. That's not mine. Um, I have to do things. Um, I have to work the steps. I have to call my sponsor. I have to get a power greater than me that I can have a relationship with. I have to go to meetings. These meetings are my insurance policy, and I'll get to a particular insurance policy in just a minute that happened in my life. I have to do everything this book talks about. This is where I learned about the disease. I love the doctor's opinion. It's my favorite chapter in the big book. This is where I learned hope. Where I learned hope. I want the keys to the kingdom, don't you? It talks about it in here. So I do on a daily basis what this program teaches me. I want to tell you a real quick story. About three and a half years sober. Um, another, it wasn't necessarily a phase, but it was something in my life that was weighing on my heart. My daddy was still in the back of my mind. 
Now, I had tried to have a relationship with him in high school. I had went to Tennessee several times to see him. I believe he was drunk or high every time I saw him. I know he had the munchies one night, because Grandma had to pick him four boxes of macaroni and cheese before he would ever stop. <laughs> but I had that desire. I wanted to have a relationship with him. Well, you know, sometimes God does for me what I can't do for myself, and, and it was on my heart, and here I go. I'm tracing off Tennessee. I've told me, Mom, my sponsor, my mama, everybody, I'm going to Tennessee to see Slim. And uh, I get up there, and uh, he was sober. Who'd have thought? He, he, had, he wasn't pulled up that day. And uh, we started taking a walk around our land. Grandma and Grandpa has beautiful land there in Tennessee, and uh, we get to this hilltop. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when God's doing for me what I can't do for myself, I had a, an out-of-body experience. And it's like I'm standing over here, and I'm looking at myself, and I'm like, who is saying those words? Where's that coming from? Okay? I began to have one of those experiences with my daddy. My daddy's standing there, and I'm talking to him, and all of a sudden I start sharing with him what I was like and what happened and what I was like today. And I got done, and I hugged him and told him I loved him, and I went back to Dusty. Now, I didn't think anything else about that. Well, a few weeks later, he called my mama, and he came to Dusty, and he got... He detoxed on my mama's couch, and he went to treatment, and he just celebrated 18 years soon. So he's a miracle in my life. Yay, God. Yay, God. Uh, he's an absolutely miracle in my life. Um, my children call him Happy Slim. Um, <laughs> now, he's still got all the tattoos. His hair ain't as long as it used to be because he's getting older. But, um, you know, he still rides a Harley, and uh, my daughter was the very first baby he ever held because he would tell people, I never got to hold my daughter, I can't hold this. So my daughter was the first baby he ever held, and that's one of my favorite pictures of him. And he's just a big old teddy bear, and I love him, and, and we talk all the time. So I want to skip to about eight years sober. You know, when I did my steps with my sponsor, we did a lot of stuff on the back porch of that clubhouse, and uh, I remember doing my fourth and fifth step with her. And I'll, I'll still, I'll never forget the way it felt when I got through unloading all that garbage to this beautiful woman, and she get, we're both crying, and she gets up and she comes over and she hugs me and she tells me she loves me and it's going to be okay. Oh, what a wonderful feeling that was. So I'm sitting there and I'm basking in the glow of just getting rid of all that garbage, and she says, okay, now i got to ask you something. I'm thinking, just let me sit here for a minute. She said, i got to ask you something. I'm like, okay, what? She says, um, what are you going to do if I go out and get drunk tomorrow? Well, now she's hanging over. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm in my glow. Why are you messing it up with this? She said, well, what are you going to do if I go out and get drunk tomorrow? I said, well, boy, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. She said, well, you go out and get another sponsor. All right. So I filed that away. Didn't think anything else about it. I was about eight and a half years sober. My sponsor went back out. She's still out there today. She's still out there. So what do I do? Well, I waited around and got a little miserable, and but then I got me a sponsor because I didn't want what had happened to me before to happen to me again. So now I want to skip, skip ahead a little bit. Seventeen and a half years sober. My, um, I have a wonderful relationship with my family. I have an absolutely wonderful husband. I'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, beautiful children. Wonderful relationship with my mother. Wonderful relationship with my grandparents. Um, you know, life is good. Life is good. We're living in Montgomery, Alabama. My husband got stationed up there at Gunner Air Force Base, and um, life's just rocking on. I had been driving back and forth to Enterprise Sun from Montgomery up about an hour and a half uh, to go to meetings, but I wasn't able to go to my home group as much because I had two small children. Well, we found out that uh, Mima was going to die from COPD and emphysema, and uh, the last two years of her life, my mother and I shared her. Uh, my mother would take care of her for two weeks in Dothan, and then I would take care of her for two weeks in Montgomery. And I wouldn't trade that time for anything, but on one particular day, we had just left her alone, doctor, and, and we knew. We knew that she wasn't going to be with us much longer. So Mama gets me mom and takes her back to Dothan, and um, Gary's at work, and the kids are in Mother's Day out, and um, I'm sitting on the couch by myself. And I'm crying, and I'm screaming at God, and I'm angry, and I'm pissed off, and I don't like all of this. I don't do well with this right here. See, the last time I felt like this, I got drunk for three months. My big mama had died. I don't like this. It's been two and a half years, and I still feel like this. 
because I love her so much. But I'm sitting there on the couch and I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to go through this again. What is this going to look like? What am I going to do? And immediately the thought came in my mind, Amanda, when this is right there, you can go down there and get whatever you want and be drunk and feel clean. I continued that thought for a minute. I thought, well, you know, I've never tried a Mike's Hard Lemonade, and I don't know what a Zima is, and <laughs> there's some other stuff out there I might like to see what it can do for me. And instantly, instantly, a plaque in my clubhouse appeared before me. My insurance policy was showing up. It was cashing in. There was a plaque on the wall, and it said, think, think, think. And I was told to the newcomer, don't look at that. That was not for me. Just skip that plaque. <laughs> but at 17 years sober, 17 and a half years sober, it was about to save my life. I said, okay, I've had the first thought. I've thought about taking the drink. What's the second thought? What was that look? You know, I would, I would ask, my husband has never seen me drink. My children have never seen me drink. I would lose all of that because I know he's not going to stay with me if I start drinking. I would lose my relationship with my mother. I wouldn't be able to help take care of me mom. What would that look like? Okay, so what's the third thought? Amanda, what are you going to do? And it scared me to death when I got on the phone and I called my sponsor. She said, girl, you get your butt to a meeting right now. You find one in Montgomery, Alabama, and you get there now. And that's the day that I found happy hour. And I got to tell you about my first few days there. I walk in that day, I've got my hat pulled down over my eyes, I'm, I've been crying for hours, I look god awful, and I sit in the back of the room, and, um, but I notice this little lady over here, she's short, she's older, she's got curly blonde hair, and her name is Miss Peggy. Now, it's not the same Miss Peggy from inside, this is a whole other new Miss Peggy. I see her over there, she's got an empty spot next to her, but I'm going to sit over here in the corner because I'm having a bad day. So that day at that meeting, um, a girl named Tina talked about she had five years sober and when her mother died she went back out. The next day I go back to that meeting. Tina's there again. She's talking about the second time she had five years sober. Her grandmother died and she went back out. The next day I get a phone call from a lady that I respect in this program in Dothan, Alabama, Mama Jean, and we're talking about that when she had eight and a half years sober her mother died and she went back out and all those years that she lost. The next day I get a phone call about a friend of ours. There's a lady named Nancy at Level Plains, and she was one of my gurus. She was one of the women I looked up to and, and learned so much from. She had 25 years sober since she went back out. She's still out there. She's homeless. She's lost her job. She doesn't have a car. We don't know if she's alive or dead. She's out there. So I thought about that. Every day I'm getting these messages. I'm like, okay, what am I hearing? What am I supposed to be learning in this? And for me, what I learned was, Amanda, it doesn't matter. If you've got 17 years, or 25 years, or 10 years, or 5 years, or just today, I have to do the same things today that I was taught when I first got sober. I have to have a sponsor. I have to call my sponsor. I have to work with my sponsor. I have to work with 12 steps. I have to go to meetings. And sometimes it's not just for me. Sometimes it's for an insurance policy. Sometimes it's because somebody needs to hear something that I've got to say. Sometimes it's to help that suffering alcoholic inside the room. Inside the room. Not just the ones out there still drinking and miserable and dying in the gutters. Sometimes we're in here suffering. I asked that short little lady, Miss Peggy, to be my sponsor. And she's my sponsor and she sees me all the time. And I call her all the time. And we go back through the steps. And I have sponsees. And I do everything that I was taught in the beginning. Now, I've got to share this other miracle in my life real quick, because it's not very often that I get to have him here. Um, I was so excited when Mr. Robert asked me to come. Um, and I had asked, you know, if we could have an extra bed, because I thought maybe a sponsor was going to come. Um, but this time, my husband got to come. And I know that my big mama brought him into my life because I'd have never found him on my own. I tried to get rid of him once and he came back. <laughs> He's an earth person. He absolutely is my soulmate. Um, and I'll tell you real quick, a real, a real quick story. Um, my sponsor told me I couldn't date for our first year of sobriety and I didn't date. So he started calling me on the 1st of May and you know, my birthday wasn't until May 19th. So I had to wait. So we talked for two and a half months on the phone every day. He was the first person I would hear in the morning, and he was the last voice that I heard every night. 
And I knew just from those phone conversations that I loved this man. So he worked at a plant, and uh, he worked on the night shift. And so his lunch break was at 10 o'clock at night. And so our very first date was after my one-year anniversary, which I did not invite him to because I wasn't ready to tell him yet that I was an alcoholic. And we went out dancing, and our very first dance was, um, um, I like big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> And so the next slow song, we're standing there and we're, we're dancing, and I said, um, will you marry me? He said, don't say that. You're going to scare me off. I said, no, I'm not. The next day, he had been dating four different girls in three different states, and he called them all up and said, I'm sorry I can't date you anymore. I found the one. So that's the story of my Gary. And uh, I was so excited for him to get to come this weekend because so many times when I travel and, and share my story, he's the one at home with the kids. My daughter's 10 and my son is 8, and uh, we have a good time. We absolutely have a wonderful time. Um, so I'm really excited about that he got to come and be with me this weekend. You know, so many times he hears me talk about my chosen family and this person and that person and this happened after the meeting and all that, but he doesn't get to soak it up. He doesn't get to feel all the goodness that's in these rooms. So I was so excited that he got to come. Um, this December 11th, we'll be celebrating 13 years of marriage, but we've been together almost 20 years. And that is absolutely miracle in my life today. I would love to tell you about all the promises in my life have come true. Fear of financial insecurity, um, making me amends, um, everybody that's been in my life, you know, and I, you know, one of the most recent miracles was that I got through me my death because of the people in these rooms, because of the love here. Because of your experience, strength, and hope, my sponsor lost six people, including family members in her life, that she was close to, including her sponsor, in a year. And if she could do that, then I could get through me lost death without taking a drink. Um, like I said, I have an absolutely wonderful life. Absolutely wonderful. I am living happy, joyous, and free today. I have a heart full of gratitude, and I try to give it away every chance I get. And um, I hope you've heard some experience, strength, and hope in my story today because it's absolutely been a pleasure to share with you. Um, I do this deal one day at a time. That's all I have is one day at a time. And still today, I do everything that I was taught in the beginning. I want to close with um, a paragraph in the big book. It's at the bottom of page 164. When Mr. Bill, the driver of that boat that I told you about, when he died, he gave me his second edition big book that he had got when he was in prison. And uh, he circled this paragraph, and he told me, he wrote in there, he said, Amanda, if you will abide by this, you will know true happiness. And what I learned a few years ago is that all 12 steps are in this one paragraph. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. In the words of Jack C., sober sure is better. My name is Amanda I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, Jack. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.